Hello, everybody. Uh, today, I'm going to present you uh, our recent work on classifying web videos using a global video descriptor. This is a joint work with uh, Shayan Modri Asari and Dr. Mubarak Shah. So, in this paper, we would like to uh, classify the human actions. So, in the first row, you see the KTH data set, and in this one, there are six action classes and each action is performed by 25 actors. This is a pretty simple uh, data set when compared to the other two data sets here which are UCA50 and HMDB51. Because KTH is, uh, the, these videos are taken in a controlled environment and the background is uh, simple whereas the UCA50 and HMDB51 videos are collected from online sources such as YouTube and uh, they are diverse. Here I will uh, talk briefly about the related work of human action recognition. We may divide the uh, methods into two broad groups. One, one is going to be the holistic uh, approach. In this one, the silhouettes, uh, human body joints or motion or contours can be modeled uh, to classify the human action. Uh, and uh, therefore, they, these uh, type of methods require the localization of the human body. Uh, through alignment, background, subtraction, or tracking. And uh, these type of settings may not be available in uncontrolled environments. The uh, more popular approach is to, use, uh, is to extract some uh, local descriptors in a neighborhood of local spatial temporal interest points. Uh, one popular uh, local uh, descriptor is the STIP, uh, which is proposed by uh, LabTab. Uh, in this one, they detect uh, 3D Harris corners, and um, uh, they e extract their uh, histograms of oriented gradients and histograms of optical flow, uh, uh, op histograms of optical flow around these interest points. Another uh, detect descriptor is the dollar descriptor. In this one, they apply Gaussian filter in space and Gabor filter in time, and whenever the response is high, they to uh, the descriptor computation. There is also the SIFT descriptor and the 3D version of SIFT. Uh, in this one, they detect the uh, maximums and minimums in scale space, and then uh, they uh, compute their histograms of gradients descriptors. This type of methods uh, usually utilize the big of features framework. Uh, even though these uh, descriptors are computed locally, they are combined in a global histogram uh, which uh, causes them to lack the global geometrical or temporal information. Also recently, uh, there are proposed some trajectory-based methods. Uh, for example, the uh, MBH. Uh, in this uh, work, they compute the foreground trajectories and they do uh, descriptor computation along the paths of these trajectories. Also, there is the there's another work by Wu. In this one, they uh, compute particle trajectories and they, do, they extract some chaotic feature, invariant features. These type of methods uh, require the segmentation of foreground and background. And um, the disadvantage of this is that they don't capture the scene information, which is the background. And it may be useful for uh, finding the type of action. And they are computationally complex. Here are goal is to uh, classify a large, large number of uh, realistic human actions. And we would like to have a global description uh, of any uh, given uh, video clip. This one way to do this uh, can be the use of frequency spectrum. Uh, for example, for the images, uh, we can have the global information uh, and the semantic content by analyzing the frequency spectrum. The, in the GIST descriptor, of Toralba, they do scene classification. And uh, for example, given a, a urban scene, a town center, we, we expect to see some buildings and which will correspond to the vertical edges. But let's say you have a scene, it's a natural scene, a beach, and you see the coast, you will expect to see some uh, horizontal edges. And these will correspond to different uh, energy components in the frequency spectrum. For the video, we may also have a global information, uh, such as the gradients. Uh, and also, we may have an idea about the motion in the scene. 
So we will analyze the energy in free, various frequency bands to do this. Here is our framework. Given a video clip uh, with size m by m and uh, t number of frames, we first compute the 3D uh, Fourier transform. Then we have a 3D filter bank, uh, and we have n filters. For the first filter, we multiply our filter with the uh, frequency spectrum, and at the end of this operation, we will have the same size, uh, a cube which is the same size as the input clip. Then we will compute the inverse transform, and uh, we will divide our a cube into uniformly sized subvolumes, and we will do quantization in each of them. And for the second filter, we do the same. And for the end filter, we do the same operation. After that, we uh, flatten these numbers and we concatenate them. And then we can apply dimension reduction using PCA, and we can train a support vector machine. So this uh, this is going to be our uh, main uh, descriptor computation block here. When we have a longer video, uh, let's say we, uh, we use k clips of it, then we use the same block again, and we use the same for the other clips, then we concatenate them, and then we uh, apply PCA, and we train our support vector machine. The motion uh, in uh, the motion in a video sequence will correspond to different components in a frequency domain. Here, let's say uh, we have a given two-dimensional pattern, F0, X, Y. And this is translating on the image plane with a velocity U1 and U2, U1 in horizontal and U2 in a vertical direction. So we will uh, obtain a space-time volume, which is given by F, X, Y, T. And this is our pattern, and it's translating here. This is the uh, 3D discrete Fourier transform uh, formula here. Here M and T are the height, width, and length of the cube. So we may substitute uh, this equation one in this uh, general formula. And this is going to be the uh, Fourier transform of our space-time volume. And we can, we can uh, arrange these terms so that we take this uh, term, the summation term, uh, with respect to time out. And this is also related to time. So this was our equation. As you see, the central part uh, is the 2D Fourier transform of uh, F0, X minus U1, T, and Y minus U2, T. And uh, using the shift property of Fourier transform, we can write the, this the fourth equation uh, as this. So here, we will have the 2D Fourier transform of F0, X, Y. And here, this is the shift term, and this is the time term. Then we take the, uh, take the uh, F0, X, F, X, Y outside the summation, and the, here we get this one. So as you see, this is the uh, Fourier transform of exponential function, which is going to be a delta function here. So this is, uh, our, uh, fr fr this is the frequency spectrum of our uh, space-time volume. And this is only going to be non-zero if this term is going to, whenever this term is zero. So this is a, a plane equation in uh, 3D. So moving objects uh, will create some space-time volumes, and they will correspond to different components. Here is an example. Uh, there is a translating object. Uh, there is one type of motion in the scene. And we obtain this space-time volume here. So the object is translating in this direction over time. And when we compute the uh, uh, Fourier transform, we have this type of uh, uh, case. So in this one, only we will have non-zero values on this plane. And this plane is going to be orthogonal to the direction of this uh, blob here. When we have two types of motion, this is going to be our space-time volume. And we will have two planes in the frequency spectrum. When we have objects with the same motion, this is going to be our space-time volume. And here, we will have one plane, again, with non-zero values. When there is different motion, the speed is different in this case, this is going to be our space-time volume. And we will 
obtain two separate planes. When our object is moving and it's os it is an oscill oscillating intensity, this is going to be our space-time volume. And we will have two planes. And the separation of these planes will be depending on the oscillation frequency. And when we have two objects, we still have the two planes. So our descriptor uh, is computed by the application of a bank of 3D filters on the spatiotemporal frequency domain. And uh, we have different orientations and bandwidths of filters which capture different elements. We don't need an interest point detection or background subtraction. And we preserve the spa useful spatial and temporal information as we do quantization in uh, grids. These are the visualization of our uh, filters in 3D. We have two scales of filters. Uh, we will have 68 uh, filters in total. So these are all the filters visualized in 3D. And uh, the transfer function uh, of these filters are given by this equation here. Here the theta and f phi are the polar and the azimuthal angles, and sigma r, sigma theta, and sigma phi are the radial and angular bandwidths. So we cho choose this type of configuration, and we did an experiment on that. We uh, collected 500 test videos, and we computed the cumulative sp uh, spectrum. So, and we saw that our uh, filter bank uh, can capture more than 99% of the uh, energy in this type of test uh, samples. We could also use more filters and we could get finer response, but that time our uh, descriptor would be longer and we would need more computations. Here uh, we can see the effect of these filters on a sample clip. Here this is horse riding action. And, um, so one of the filter, uh, we uh, apply one of each filter, and we take the inverse Fourier transform, and we see uh, we see these type of uh, output clips here. So one filter, for example, is uh, enhancing the motion component, which is corresponding to the rider, and the another one enhanced the uh, motion of the legs here, and also there are some filters which capture the gradient components. For example, this one is capturing the vertical components. And the second one is capturing the horizontal component. And the last one is capturing some diagonal components in the scene. This is another example. We have two cars. And uh, this time, the scene background is static. And um, we still have some filters which may capture the motion of this car here and the motion of second car in this row. And also, uh, in the uh, second row, you can see some filters are capturing the vertical scene components, horizontal components, and also some diagonal components. So our uh, descriptor, just 3D, can capture both motion and scene information. And here, uh, this is another example. These four sequences are collected from a public data set. And, uh, this, these arrows show the relationship of these clips. For example, this is jumping at park scene, and the uh, second one is jumping at urban scene. And these are the same action in different scenes. Also, if you look at here, you can see that these, uh, in this column, these two clips are different actions in same scenes, and same here. And these blue arrows show different actions in different scenes. We, uh, we uh, computed our descriptor for these four sequences. And they look like this. And we then uh, computed the uh, uh, descriptor distances. And we saw that uh, whenever uh, the action and the scene are different, the value of the, uh, the distance is higher. And uh, if, one, if the scene or if the action is similar, then we get a relatively lower distance which shows that uh, it can capture both motion and scene information. We performed uh, experiments on three data sets. And 
here the UCA50 and HMD51 are the two challenging data sets. They have a large number of classes. These are our experimental settings here. Our clip size was 128, 128 by 64, and we extracted three clips, and we used 68 filters. Um, our grid size was uh, 16 by 16 by 8, which resulted in 512 sub-volumes, and we have a, around 100,000 dimensional feature vector here. Then we applied principal component analysis, and uh, we trained our support vector machines and we did cross validation. Uh, this is the average uh, multi class classification accuracy on KTH data set. Our descriptor had 92% accuracy, which is slightly better than STIP and uh, slightly lower than the state of the art. The, um, this is the confusion table on KTH data set. So we have some confusion around running, jogging, and walking. These are our results on the UCF50 data set. So here we can see uh, our descriptor is 65.3%, whereas the GIST, GIST, since it doesn't have any motion information, uh, in the same configuration, it's just at 37% accuracy. And STIP using 2,000 dimensional codebook, it has 54.3%. Also, we uh, combined our descriptor with STIP using late fusion, and we got even more uh, perf better performance, which is 8% 8, 8 more. These are the confusion tables uh, of STIP, the GIST, and uh, our descriptor, GIST3D, and the GIST3D, and STIP. As you see, our uh, confusion tables uh, look better than these two descriptors. And uh, we would like to see why our descriptor performed better than STIP. So rather than using the support vector machine, uh, we looked at the raw descriptors and we computed the uh, average similarities of descriptors among each action class. Here on UCA50, there are 50 action classes. So each entry is showing the average similarities of descriptor among any action class. So our descriptor has uh, higher uh, intra-class similarity and lower inter-class similarity, which shows why it performs better. These are the quantitative results on HMDB51. So our descriptor, the STIP had 18.3% accuracy, and our descriptor had 23.3% accuracy. And the combined classifier had 29% accuracy. This is the confusion table for STIP. And these are the confusion tables of our descriptor. We performed the same experiment on HMDB51 as well. We computed the average similarities of descriptors, and we observed the same output here, uh, higher intra-class similarity and lower inter-class similarity. So, my final comments are that we uh, presented here a scene and motion descriptor. We don't need any interest point detection, and we don't have a global histogram. So we preserve the spatial and temporal information. Our performance on UCA50 and HMDB51 were uh, the best reported results so far. Our uh, performance on KTH is slightly lower than the state of the heart. The reason is KTH does not include uh, useful background information. Thank you very much.